if we are basically sincere uh, and we mean what we're doing, people can feel the difference. And that is the foundation of trust and rapport. It's feeling the difference. It's not hearing the right words. It's hearing words that have the right feeling. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome to this episode of B2B EQ. I'm your host, Tim Harris, and today's guest is a leader in B2B sales and marketing, an advocate of human connection. He has spent the last decade helping business professionals be more personal and human through simple video messages, host of the Customer Experience Podcast, author of Human-Centered Communication and Rehumanize Your Business, Chief Evangelist at BombBomb, and we'll get more into what Chief Evangelist means. Ethan, Great to have you on. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. I enjoy our conversations, Tim, and I uh, look forward to seeing where this one goes. Absolutely. Well, let's jump right in. In B2B sales, what is the one soft skill that you believe creates the biggest impact in relationships, but also grows revenue? Uh, I'll go with two, uh, and one builds off the other. Uh, first one, I'll go curiosity. Um, I know that one's getting a lot of play lately, but it's true, like really wondering why and being willing to ask. And then the follow on skill that I think is underdeveloped relative to curiosity, although the more something gets lip service, I think the more people think they're doing it, even if they're not. Um, And I am offering that to curiosity. The follow on skill is uh, active listening, really stepping back, being present and listening and not listening to respond, obviously, and not listening to know how you should direct the sales conversation, but listening to understand. Um, so I think that combo of, of curiosity and active listening, um, I think we'd be better people, not just better salespeople uh, if we did those things. It's interesting you said curiosity to start because Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, I mean, that got a lot of, of traction in the last few years. And now I think it's on everybody's desk um, or so it seems. But his concept isn't just start with why, but it's it's to your point, maybe be curious and and understand what motivates or what underlies that emotion or that decision. We're not spending enough time there, you think? Uh, no, I don't think so. And I because you know obviously to a bias toward efficiency, some urgency, as we're recording this, the economic climate in general isn't amazing. Um, and so I think that adds a layer of urgency. And so I think very often um, we're asking questions to get answers that we need to qualify or to advance or to shut something down um, or to sell faster or more effectively. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But I think if we're going to create and deliver value over the long term and actually qualify people and actually help people, it does start with being curious about uh, what's going on for them and in their business and uh, listening to them to understand. It, it makes sense. I, when we sit and listen, you start to build those relationships, that trust and rapport that, that creates, like you're saying, longer term relationships. And fascinating as we do go into kind of a tough economic time, especially in the tech sector, it's been very interesting to see the constant quote of do more with less. So there's only a few dials we can really push on, right? I mean, speed up the machine, great, but at the at the cost of sounding the same to everybody or, or being extremely, you know, high volume, low empathy, low, low personalization. But then we're struggling, I think right now with that's not working. What's your take on, on some of that? Yeah, I think um, in general, um, if we are basically sincere uh, and we mean what we're doing, people can feel the difference. And that is the foundation of trust and rapport. It's feeling the difference. It's not hearing the right words. It's hearing words that have the right feeling, right? So humans intuitively know when someone is aligned with them, when someone actually cares, when someone means the words that they're saying, when someone... Uh, 
understands you or seeks to understand you, we can tell the difference. I mean, one of the one of the cliche ways to refer to it is the BS meter. So we know when someone is going through the motions versus when someone is actually present with us. And I would just caution people that in the rush to do all of the things, and I'm not here to tell any sales leader that activity quotas are not as important as outcome quotas, although everyone should know that intuitively, um, that we should be willing to make some trade-offs there because I think we get farther, um, actually faster when we do some of these things, essentially allow people to feel seen and heard and understood and valued. It's the core foundations of like Carnegie's book, Winning Friends and Influencing People. It's none the, of it's new. Yeah. None of it. None of it's new. We're going back to the building blocks, but put up against, I can hear this from, from some of those in the audience, you know, the, it's a commercial relationship. I have a quarter to close. I have, you know, how do we balance that? What are some of the yeah. advice you have for listeners? Cause I think that's where the tough part is. Yep. And this is the kind of the art and science of sales. Uh, I think people that are successful recognize that it takes a little bit of both. And if we bias too far one way or the other, um, we're uh, too efficient with a lack of empathy and a, and not an amazing buying experience or customer experience. Um, and if we buy us too far the other way, we spend a lot of time and we're highly inefficient. I actually think that curiosity and active listening when um, executed is empathy in action. Like, I think that's what that is. Like, it's not um, becoming someone's best friend. It's not, you know, a whole bunch of small talk. It's really... You can be very direct with people and still be incredibly empathetic because in that it's seeking to understand where someone is, what their real problem is. Again, like one layer deeper, one layer deeper to understand what's actually going on here to determine whether you can help them and the best way to help them um, and being honest with yourself and the other person. If you can't, that's one of the ways to get the efficiency back. There's no reason to shoehorn a deal in that's not going to renew because, you know, especially in software or technology in general, you know, that initial close um, very often isn't even profitable. Um, you know, it, it's on that first renewal um, or some way, somewhere midway uh, past that even um, that, that, that the deal becomes profitable. And so I think the more we can do that up front, um, the better off we are. And so when people get resistant to the idea of empathy, like it just sounds too soft, it just means asking good questions and actively listening. And um, it doesn't have to take a lot of time, um, especially when someone gets good at it. I, I agree. I, I think the efficiency gain can almost be from knowing what signals to listen for, right? Th those Absolutely. I, an old analogy was the the mechanic that takes your whole car apart, right? To find one little squeaky thing and fix it. And it takes all day. Or the gentleman that just sits back, hears the car run, listens, goes back, turns a little something, the squeak's gone. Well, there's an efficiency in listening. Yeah. You don't need to go five layers deep on why for something that isn't relevant, right? So the goal is to find, I love your analogy. It's a perfect one for exactly uh, where I'm at in my own head on this is, um, you know, standing back, listening for the squeak and saying, is it this or is it that? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, deeper, deeper, no, deeper, deeper, yes. You know, so that you can, once you get to do and again, that's the art side of it a little bit. It's this thing mm -hmm. that's more difficult to coach. Um, and the caution again is not rushing through the script as offered for what this 25 minute meeting should be, but instead uh, creating enough space and enough efficiency to go one or two or three layers deeper where it's going to be really valuable for both parties. And that, that makes sense because it's it comes back to how sales and how business has been done for so long. Now I think we throw in the current conditions and the fact that most of our interactions, most of these meetings, you and I are now we're staring at a mirror of ourselves. We're on a, a meeting where we're showing slides, show up and throw up at sometimes, right? How does this environment change? You, you've been working in the video and, and sales and marketing space for so long. What have you seen change? What works? What doesn't? Uh, in general, I mean, obviously cameras on. I mean, that goes kind of without saying, but it is shocking. I was, it was within the, it was in the past 12 months, not the calendar year, uh, but the past 12 months, you know, it was sometime like spring last year. And 
I was in a meeting. I, I presume we never got this far. And I took the meeting and I was clear on why I took the meeting that I would be a potential champion and certainly an influencer if this made sense for our business. And um, I assume that it would have been like a mid to high five figure annual commitment, maybe a six figure annual commitment. So like not a small deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I go back and forth with this guy, just, I wanted to make sure that he knew that I am not the person who's going to say yes and DocuSign today. (laughs) Um, but, but I was super interested in it and I was actually a good starting point for our organization to kind of have this conversation to to, to determine some value and see if it's worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. And this person gets on, it was like essentially an appointment setter. And then the account executive, they both get on. We were on that call for about 35 minutes. It was scheduled for 45 And neither one of them turned their cameras on. I'm like, it's, I know that I'm not evaluating you as a human being as in order to make my decision, I'll buy whatever you have to sell. If I feel good about you, Mm -hmm. like I know, but at the same time, we can't ignore the fact that the person is a critical part of it. Do I like this person? Do I trust this person? Does this person seem to believe what they're saying? Can I believe what they're saying? Do they seem aligned with my interests? Are they asking good questions to seek to understand me? Are they, they seem to understand what I'm saying and do they seem to understand my concerns or my points of excitement? These are things that humans, human beings are doing constantly, subconsciously in order to make good, safe, healthy choices for their present and future. It's something that we've done for millennia. It's something we've done for all time. It's something we get better and better at. Uh, those who are terrible at it have perished. Those who are good enough at it, we are their their uh, spawn. Uh, yeah. You know, many many generations later, and so this idea of um, showing up and being present. Um, and now I'm speaking a little bit outside a sales call. I would be mind blown. Although I I'm not on enough sales calls, I guess I'm sure it's happening um, for people multitasking or yeah. being distracted in these kinds of things. It's like it's we're here for a reason. We're being present. Um, and, and whether we do that over the phone or on a video call or in person, in person is obviously best. Um, people are still looking to make these judgments before they even care about any of the details you have to offer. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you're a straight up gatekeeper to the opportunity. And in that case, I'd say your job is going to be automated very soon, right? The, the, to, for human beings to be in these jobs, we add a lot of cost. Yeah. And perhaps some complexity and some inefficiency and some messiness because we get sick, we take vacations, uh, we mess up, all these things. And so if a human is to be involved in these processes, let's just say the, the sales and marketing process, then we need to add unique human value. And it really is in these kind of softer skills. It is an emotional intelligence period. Well, it's our human competitive advantage. It, it's Yeah. At the end of the day, we're really good at these human skills and then let chat GPT write the email, right? <laughs> yeah. Or at least give us the foundation for it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So I want to move a little bit over to your role, chief evangelist at Bomb. That's not a title that, that typically comes up in a lot of companies, but I want to look at it from the idea of breaking through the noise and kind of how that role is starting to come up, what you're seeing come up in the industry with that. So tell me a little bit about, first and foremost, the role of chief evangelist, what it looks like, and then we'll kind of dive in from there. Okay. Um, So bottom line on it is, if you are innovating, you must be evangelizing. Here... Innovation is really in one of two categories. One is solving a known problem in a truly unique way. The other is solving a problem most people don't even know that they have, right? So in general, we might call this, um, some people might be pursuing it from a category creation or category design perspective. In general, I go higher up and just say innovation. If you're actually innovating, then you must be evangelizing. And evangelism, where it differs from perhaps, say, traditional sales and marketing kind of at its core, is that you're evangelizing the problem, not the product, right? And so essentially, you know, it's the foundation for it, of course, is point of view, which is what is the state of the world? What is the status quo? What's wrong with the status quo such that we need this innovation, right? And so in that first category of the two categories of innovation, 
you know, it's, you know, certainly there are some solutions available around this problem. Um, they look a little bit like this or a little bit like this or a little bit like that, but those all have their unique shortcomings and they're not addressing kind of this emerging opportunity or emerging uh, threat. Um, therefore, we're innovating in this particular. So it's, it's all about the problem, not the product. It's essentially preparing a market to understand how to evaluate and buy a solution that they're not currently thinking about. And so just to draw the parallel at BombBomb, Bomb, and then I'll give it back to you to kind of go, yeah. I'll go, I can go as deep as you want. Um, you know, video email and video messaging is essentially the mechanics of what we provide. And, you know, when I started with this company, I started part-time back in 2009. I joined the company full-time in 2011. If you think about the state of video email messaging uh, or video email and video messaging in 2011, there was no, I mean, the search volume on it was nil. No one knew the problem that they had, which is that you're entrusting your most important and most, most valuable messages to faceless typed out text, which comes with a number of problems that I won't detail at the moment. But I think all of us would kind of intuitively know, you know, it's hard to capture emotion and tone. It's hard to get to detail and complexity. It's hard to build a relationship through faceless typed out text. And so people aren't thinking about this. They're just doing what they've done. They're doing what... Um, you know, they learn to do on their way into the business or into the industry. And that is, you know, when we can't be in person, we either get on the phone or we type out our messages and that has problems. So I, you know, this needs some education and evangelism, not about here's this video email solution. Here's some of the features. Here's some of the benefits of those features. Like no one's prepared for that. You need to prepare the market for the conversation of faceless typed out text. Really not the best option. Let's talk about that. I love I love how you simplify that for me because what I took away is faceless type out text. And I'm thinking to myself, 80 to 90% of our business communication with people we work with every day is faceless typed out text. Then you want to add on, to, and there's a lot of confusion and misunderstandings that form right there with people you work with or your family members or whatever. We've all read a text and read it wrong. Totally. And, and, they, and they put in the deal. smiley face so that you know that they're joking, yeah. but they really read it as like, this dude's passive aggressive. What's his problem right now? <laughs> and and then you take business and you put a smiley face in a, in a business email and then it's really confusing. Or you're sitting there going, I can't wait. No, I can't put the emoji in there. This is a client. I have to be more professional. So you lose even that dimension. So I want to, I want to double tap on that because in sales, how how is video helping overcome that? How have you seen it overcome it? And then where do you think this goes in terms of our communication to breaking through the noise? Yeah, I'll go to, um, I, I've already kind of hinted at some of the dynamics in our initial talk kind of around the EQ mm -hmm. piece at a high level and kind of skills around it. If you think about what most salespeople are doing, all of the initial kind of follow-up, whether it's inbound or outbound, all the initial uh communication is steered toward a face-to-face -face meeting. Mm -hmm. Typically now that's on, on Zoom or Team or Google Meet or whatever. Um, in some cases, it's still, if it's, if it's more of a local or regional thing, it might be an in-person thing. All of this is to steer it to getting face-to-face. And the reason we steer it that way is that we're better. We can read more information from the other person. We can understand them more clearly. They get to know us. We all know that, again, if a human being is involved, you better believe that it's to build some trust, establish some rapport and some credibility and, and this uh, you know alignment, feelings of alignment, things that we need to demonstrate to people. Mm -hmm. And we can't just say to people, you can't tell someone how trustworthy you are. And in fact, the more that you, you know, push on that, the less trustworthy you seem. So, so, so much of the, um, and, and this is also how we um, recruit and hire salespeople as well. What are these skills like? What are their interactive skills like? What is their, how do they feel in a conversation? And then we equip these people behind pre-written emails, scripts, faceless voice messages, et cetera. And so in light of the idea that the whole goal is to build some sense of trust and rapport and relationship, and we know that the human being face-to-face -face is the best way to do that, video messaging in general gets you face-to-face -face earlier and more often. Uh, it allows you to communicate more clearly. I'll also give you just a kind of a science layer to it is, mm -hmm. especially if you're re representing technology, right? Like a big company, um, or a big brand or 
something like that. If we want people to feel positively toward the product, service, and company, especially early stages before it's solved a bunch of your problems, we need to put a social handle on that mug or glass, right? Like I'm not just going to pick it up and feel some attachment to it. Like humans want to attach to things. And so by putting a human being out earlier, um, it allows that level of attachment out of the gate as well. I would also just say from a pure uh, measurement standpoint, video has very well proven through a number of, and I could go through some um, I don't know, case studies or, or A-B tests and these types of things, um, increases replies and responses, which is to say nothing of the quality and warmth of responses, increases conversion when it's used in the communication process leading up to conversion, um, allows people to stay in touch more effectively over time. There's just a number of benefits in general to mixing some video messages in with your typed out emails, with your voicemails, with your LinkedIn messages, et cetera. Well, and it and it goes back to all the circle of building trust and and active listening, giving something personalized to somebody, answering something for them. When you do that video, I, I think you know you, you just probably caught somebody a little off guard and a little bit like, wow, they took the time, they took the effort to actually sit there and record, put themselves in an awkward position for my betterment or for my behalf. Correct. And that's all happening subconsciously. I've got two things I'll share here. Yeah. One is something specifically about that, uh, about this, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did this for me. And the other one will be a very specific use case that pluses up some of the things you just said. So let's just say a prospect, uh, you know, you've had two meetings with them or two calls or whatever, uh, and they just reach out, you know, before that, you know, in, in between whatever the next touch point is, they just reach out with, the, hey, been thinking about this. Um, I've got two questions. Here they are. Now, you could type them out and it could take you three or four or five paragraphs. You could drop in a couple of links to support articles or whatever the case may be. A, that presents like a homework assignment to the other person. B, you're going to spend a lot of time on it, making sure you capture it correctly, explain it correctly. Most of us are not great writers. Um, and so that slows us down. So let's just say that email takes you 13 minutes to respond to. Mm -hmm. Well, you already know the answer. And a lot of what you're doing here is just kind of, you know, taking what's what what you know intuitively and getting intellectual, bringing it to the forefront of your mind, articulating it, typing it into the keyboard and hoping that you do it clearly, kind of reviewing it to make sure that it's clear because you know very well this might get forwarded to other people in the account. Um, and you want to be concise because you don't want it to look like a homework assignment. And so you could... I, I forget what number I just threw out, 14 minutes to type that email. Yeah. You could probably in three minutes and 14 seconds, hit record and say, hey, Tim, great to hear from you. Two really good questions, two very common questions. I'm going to take them in the exact order you asked because they actually layer onto each other. There are two ways to think about that first question. It's like X, Y, and Z, but typically based, I mean, based on what I know versus what I hear typically, I think for you, it really is blah, 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 blah. And to the other half of the question, the reason that ties on is this, that, and the other thing. And so um, here's a way to think about that. Now, if you want to jump on a call and talk about it, we can do that. Um, in the meantime, I put a link right over top of this video where you can read a little bit more about it. I want to make sure you're clear on this. I know this is a big deal for you all. Um, so let me know how I can help. Thanks again for asking. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks for watching this video, right? You already know the answers. You just talk to them. You just hit record and talk to them like they're there with you. And so you don't need to schedule a 15 minute Zoom call to answer their question. You don't need to turn it into a homework assignment. And in general, we speak four times faster than we type. Um, and if you're me that you kind of push that out a little bit, cause I'm kind oh, of yeah, a fast talker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, so that's the deal. And then they can forward it inside the account. And when people get it and they see that three minutes and 12 seconds, this dude just took three minutes and 12 seconds. Cause what you said is true. Like, you know, made themselves available in kind of an honest, straightforward way, just sitting in their office or their home office, whatever. The other aspect of it is three minutes and 12 seconds of your undivided time and attention where you're just looking into the camera, talking to them about them, their problem, their question, their perspective, layered with your personality, your expertise, and your knowledge. And then they can easily forward it to other people and you don't need to rely on them to be your proxy in that account. You're creating some presence and awareness and trust within that account. Now, I love that. That was a, that was a lot. 
But here's the use case. One of my very favorite video messages, besides thank you, like I encourage anyone who wants to explore video messaging to start with sending three thank you messages once a week, you know, Thursday morning, 745 before you start your work day, let's say, um, send three thank you, thank you, good job, congratulations, I just saw on LinkedIn that dot, 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 so excited for you, like just bring these things to life, really easy to do, get you familiar with your software and get you comfortable on camera. The money video in a sales context is post-call. Uh, especially the first call, right? Whether it's a Zoom meeting, a phone call, whatever it is in person, most people, what they're doing is taking notes and then they're typing up their notes and they're sending their notes to the people, perhaps with some pricing or whatever else is relevant, depending on, you know, the nature of the sale and the, you know, the sales cycle. Um, doing that as a video allows you to use their own words back to them to meet them where they were emotionally. Some people are coming to you out of sheer desperation. Everything's on fire. I need a solution. I need your help. Mm -hmm. Make this easy for me. Make it fast. And please don't charge me a zillion dollars, right? Like the, this desperate. But yeah. other times we're having the exact same meeting, but it's with someone who wants to take something good and make it great. Um, or they, you know, whatever, like people are at, my point here is that people are at emotion, different emotional states in different points in the journey. And so your ability to follow up after that call, use their words with them, uh, push again on any of the buttons that made them excited or intrigued, or really had some promise and value in there, um, readdress any objections that came up. Um, and then of course, still include some bullet points down below, include pricing if that's what you're doing. But again, that video message allows you to let the other person know that you heard them, you saw them, you're aligned with them, you have a solution for them, you're someone that they can look to uh, for trust and guidance through this process. It just allows, if you're a good salesperson and you are sincere, this allows you to put that forth and again, easily forward to other people who weren't in the meeting that may influence or maybe even make the decision. Well, it makes all the sense in the world, right? Because we can talk to loved ones even if you take it back just to a personal level. And if I send somebody a video, they're going to feel more loved, more special, and more more made to go, oh, wow, that person took some time. Now you think, I love the the use case of after a meeting because that's where I think a lot of people are challenged. You learn all of this information about somebody, but what do you send them afterwards? Hey, great to meet with you. Here was the pain points I heard you said. Here's how we can solve it. That's pretty generic. It's not the personal touches of, oh, okay, we've got to get this by this date for you. I'll make sure you, you answer these questions because you're going to have two people that you need to share this with. Introduce me to them. Here, you can introduce me over video. You are. You're starting to actually build rapport in an account. I, I love how that breaks through the noise. Relating that back and tying that back to EQ, some of those foundational building blocks. What's some of the psychology? I almost think of it as that evangelist role. What's some of that psychology that's working in the background of that? Uh, of of experiencing the video message? Of experiencing that video message and then the idea that somebody's putting things back into like my personal context, like kind of turning the lens, I guess you could say. Yeah. Again, I, and I've said this uh I'll I'll say something I've said earlier in the conversation, hopefully in different words. Um, humans, again, have evolved to make good, safe, healthy choices. The two criteria by which every single social, social judgment is made are warmth and competence. Uh, and warmth trumps competence. Uh, one of the kind of common ways we say it is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the reason that this is true, as trite as it may sound to, to hear these truisms or cliches or whatever, um, the reason that it's true is that if a human being was not judging warmth, again, this is intent, this is motivation, this is alignment, this is, can I trust this person? Does this person seem to believe what they're saying? Can I believe what this person is saying? We're doing all of this subconsciously all of the time. And the reason we do this is that if we were not judging warmth and we were only going on competence, does mm -hmm. this check the boxes? Does this sound like an attractive solution? Then we could very easily be manipulated and taken advantage of. So 5,000 years ago, if you were just judging competence and not judging warmth, the consequences could be fatal potentially. Now, the consequences today probably aren't fatal, but it could certainly result in identity theft, for example. Now, now I'm going outside the bounds of yeah. like a buying and selling scenario, but 
there are still reasons for us to be heightened toward people's warmth. And again, warmth is not something you can tell people. You can't tell someone that you're honest. You can't tell someone that you're trustworthy. You can't tell someone that you uh, have a great deal of perseverance and that you're a real problem solver. These are things that other people have to intuit, notice, judge consciously or subconsciously about you. And again, this is why you are in the sales role. Mm-hmm. is to make people, there's a lot of different forms of value we can deliver. I think one of the problems in sales today when it's not done well is that we're too focused on ROI, ROI calculators and the like. Can I yeah. can I argue with someone enough and, and uh, make compelling enough, tell stories and make compelling enough um, um, pitches and share enough examples of other people that are kind of like them about how I can help turn this investment into even more money Um, that is one form of value and it's a big deal. It matters, Mm -hmm. but there are multiple forms of value. And one of those is emotional value. And so it's this idea that I am in good hands. Um, this is less likely to blow up in my face. If I get someone to sign off on this thing, it's going to reflect favorably on me, not unfavorably on me. And it's going to be a benefit to my tenure in this company, in this role, as opposed to a detriment to it that could perhaps get me out of the role. These are things that humans are worried about all of the time. So again, consequences aren't fatal, but we're looking for the signs that we're making a good, safe, healthy choice that's good for us in the long run. And the human being is in there to help the other human being feel that way. I I think it's what I'm hearing is that solutioning component. Like we want a seller that's going to be on the ground with us, so to say, solutioning and solving with us. Because anybody can just give me a features and functionality sheet that checks the boxes that says, oh, yeah, I have the same features as X, Y, and Z products. I think we've all gotten there. And and I, I look back to more commoditized industries, and that's what they've been run on for years. It wasn't, oh, I'll beat this price or offer these these services that somebody else offers, but it's, I'll be there Monday morning when you need it, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the phone Sunday night at 8 p.m. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh my, so, I, I'm just really glad you brought up commoditized, by the way. Every industry tends yep. toward commoditization over time. Some are faster than others, but there are successful sellers in highly commoditized industries. We serve a bunch of them at BombBomb mortgage loan officers, financial advisors, and wealth managers, insurance sales. These are insanely commoditized. We all know multiple people who do this work. And so generally what the technology is doing for them, it's the investment is typically back end, back office, back of house, backstage, however you want to think about like the guts and the operations of the business, simply to add efficiency there because the margins are tough because it's a commoditized space. Mm -hmm. And that does make sense. You need to do that. But this idea of really leaning into the human side, the EQ side, the differentiation in all of those industries, in any highly commoditized industry, Mm -hmm. the differentiation comes through the customer experience delivered by a human being. That is the point of differentiation. And so um, where, and, and, and most software, at least hardware, maybe has some nuances to it that I'm not as familiar with, but you know, if, if one of our, if we launch a new feature, And people are going nuts about it and people are unsolicited posting on social media about it or whatever. It could take a matter of hours or at worst, a matter of months uh, for a competitor to prioritize that, knock it off and build that same thing. So product parity, hyper competition and commoditization drive us further into this idea that we need our people to be front and center more often, more solution oriented, as you just said. Um, and more available to people to make them feel seen and heard and understood and to help them move forward in good, safe, healthy ways. You couldn't have said it better than I. I, If we've got a message for the future. So with that, what are you excited about for the future? What do you see with all of this in in next 10 years? What do you see changing in in the markets? Um, In general? Yeah. Just, just some of your observations. I like. I see the chief evangelist role that you have been a part of that has been a, a growing trend. I see obviously the 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 consolidation of revenue teams and and also consolidation of a lot of these markets. But what are some of the things that you've you've witnessed and and where you see it going over the next few years? Yeah, really good. Okay, um, thank you for that context. Uh, I'll speak mm-hmm. to a couple of different things. Yes, I do think the chief evangelist 
uh, whether it's that title or not, Mm -hmm. um, will become more common. And I think it's driven in part by kind of the exhausted nature of the traditional B2B sales and marketing playbook that's come up over the past and and evolved in a lot of really nice ways um, over the past, say, 15 years or so. And the idea here is right on point for everything we've been talking about, which is the human embodiment and the human expression and the human experience created of um, the values, the purpose, the mission, mission, the concept, the point of view about the world, what's good about it, what's bad about it, where we're going, all of these things. The idea that I can, uh, that our team and our company can have a human embodying and expressing all of those ideas in a way that allows people to feel more connected to the ideas and more connected to the brand, not just more connected to that individual human being, just kind of that blending of the two, I think is a really unique thing. Um, I'm really excited about um, really the right. I mean, as we're recording this, of course, we're still in the, in the early mid stages of the chat GPT hype cycle. Um, I think if this goes the same way, a lot of technology has gone. We'll see that a lot of people are lazy about it and and implement it in shallow ways. That's to say, rather than augmenting unique and powerful work that they're doing with these tools, ChatGPT in particular, Mm -hmm. most people are going to outsource the better part of it to it, ask it a question, then publish the answer as if it's their own answer. And so one of the things I talk about a lot is the sheer volume of noise and pollution in these digital environments that we're forced to try to connect and communicate in. And in this way, I think... To the degree, and 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 I'm speaking specifically now to something that produces written content um, that could be turned into other forms of content, but certainly we're seeing a lot more synthetic media in general, um, imagery, even video being synthetic. I think the the ease and speed with which we can create that um, at this point, primarily through AI, is going to create just a ton more noise and pollution. And I think that gives us more opportunity yet on top of what we have today to put people in a great position to make other people feel amazing. Empathy is something that every single human being is desperate for. And it is, so the demand is steady and growing and the supply is dwindling because we don't feel like we have time for it. We're, you know, we're, we're burdened with the digital divide and the physical divide. And so it becomes harder to do. Um, Fewer people are willing to do it. And so Something that every single human being needs and wants that is in diminishing supply is only going to be increasingly valuable in the future. So human to human connection, human to human interaction um, needs to be supported by technology, but it also needs to be direct. Um, and that will be a, a further differentiator in the future too. So I'm excited about that. I mean, I also like the idea that a lot of these advances are forcing us to reflect on what are human strengths. I mean, it's something yeah. you spoke to earlier in our conversation. It's like it's easy to take for granted um, human strengths, distinct, unique human strengths, because in part, they look like flaws, imperfection, uh, variability. Um, You know, it's easy to look at the things that are bad about the the human condition and the human experience relative to what we think is maybe perfect about something that doesn't sleep, something that doesn't need to eat, except maybe electricity, um, <laughs> something that doesn't get sick, something that doesn't take vacation, something that doesn't have to pick anyone up from daycare. Like it's easy to look at that as perfect, but it's not. It's just a unique s- a set of strengths that we need to pair together with this messier, more emotional, more wonderful uh, human side of it. Speaking of the human side, I, I want to take a little bit of time. I, I think. You're you're spot on, and and I hope that that rings true. That that humans can use this technology to really, really augment our natural abilities, because that's where I see it being the, the the win-win. But take me back to little Ethan. You know, I you're now in Colorado Springs, Colorado, but take me back to kind of what got you to this point, and and what built your career. Yeah, super fast. Um, I always loved school. I was good at school. I only applied to the University of Michigan. I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I applied there because I didn't know what I wanted to study. Big school, lots of good programs, and it was in-state public school. So it was, you know, relatively affordable compared to all the other options. Never had a career orientation whatsoever. Studied whatever I wanted to study. Ended up with a degree in communication and psychology. But as it dawned on me that I would be done with school soon, I have since done an MBA as well, but as it dawned on me then that I would need to, you know, 
have some gainful employment if I didn't want to live in my parents' basement, which I did not want to do <laughs> as much as I love them. Um, I joined the PR club and they were all talking about like their internships, you know, as they went back to Chicago or New Jersey or wherever they were from um, at, uh, and I'm dating myself here, the newspapers, the radio stations, the television stations. And so I went back to Grand Rapids for the summer and um, got an internship at a television station. I ended up uh, becoming a writer, producer, editor um, of, you know, TV spots and campaigns. Um, I led marketing teams doing that work in Grand Rapids in Chicago and then out here in Colorado Springs. And I was just bored with it. So I was doing a lot of project work at the time. I was working on my MBA at the time. And I met the two co-founders of BombBomb, um, really liked who they were and um, they needed some work. So I, I worked for them part-time for two years before I joined full-time. And that was just, you know, writing landing pages, uh, making videos, et cetera. And so um, as I got in and I understood what they were doing, um, it was really fun to shift from this expensive, produced, slow, formal, polished form of video communication to this lightweight, personal, conversational tone. And that was exactly where really everything was going. And now here we are working from home, you know, in nice clothes, but no one's all dressed up. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the formality in the profet air quote professional stuff that we used to do um, isn't required anymore. It's about connecting with people and being of service and value um, in every form. And so that was like the that shift in the way I was working with video, thinking about video, exploring video, teaching video was perfectly on par with where we were going kind of from a cultural and a specifically business culture um, perspective. And so um, it's just been super stimulating. It's been an absolute joy. I've written two and a half books on the topic. I get to host a podcast on our behalf. And um, I think uh, it's an absolute privilege to explore and share these ideas because I think they matter a lot. And I hope that's come through our conversation. Yeah. I, it's, it's so interesting. I, I listened to your history and I'm thinking, all of this culminated in a pretty cool way. I mean, communications, writing, marketing, all of it. And now I see where you are today. It's quite a, quite a build. So if you could take yourself back to right after you graduated, kind of not knowing what you were going to do, what's a piece of advice you'd give yourself? Um, so as I said, I loved school. I was really good at school. I uh, There are flaws with the education system on whole. Um, and one of them that a lot of people like to to um, throw rocks at, um, I will do for a moment too, is that I just had way too high of a task orientation. And by that, I mean, I thought it was about the work. I thought it was about the output. I thought it was about the product. And of course the outcome related, like I is not just doing work for work's sake. I, I thought I was just very, very task oriented. And I would say, um, especially early in my career, I was insufficiently relationship oriented. And so if it was a choice between carrying that conversation on and asking two more follow-up questions to the general manager of the television station or getting back in there and knocking out more work. Certainly the former may have been better in my long-term interest. And that's true even in um, not even in a kind of subordinate leader dynamic, like the people around me period, there's so much to learn and so much to enjoy all around us. And I think it is key to moving a career forward. And so I would just in some, you know, a higher relationship orientation and a lower task orientation. Um, yeah, more of a balance, I guess I should say. Yeah, it echoes in in kind of where you see some of those skills and curiosity and the active listening. And so amazing um, way to kind of reflect on that. Um, Outside of work, outside of the stuff you do with Bomb Bomb, you're in Colorado. I've got to think you're probably pretty active. Tell us uh, maybe a little bit about what you love to do for passions and hobbies. Yeah, I'll pick up right there. I mean, I'm not a skier because I grew up in Michigan and that's just a bunch <laughs> of icy hills, you know, like nothing like what we have here. Our son, when we moved out here, he was really, really young. And so, um, you know, my wife and I always had back of mind like, well, if he decides he wants to ski or snowboard or some of his buddies bring him into it, you know, maybe we'll get involved. That never happened. So um, I love to run and hike and walk. So, you know, every day I at least take a walk downtown here in Colorado Springs, but I'm out running and hiking all the time. I can't even tell you how many mountains I've summited because I'm not really a checklist person, but um, many dozens. Um, I really appreciate 
um, the amount of parks, open spaces, and wilderness that are that are dedicated out here. Uh, and I wish there was more of that in more places because, um, again, just on this theme of balance, picking up on my last response and really that all of us are seeking all of the time, um, I think we've lost balance relative to our natural environment, clean air, mm-hmm. clean water, clean soil, appreciating the value of these things that don't have any measurable value from an economic perspective, um, knowing the names of plants, for example, yeah. allows us to feel closer to them. Um, and I think that if humanity on a whole had more respect for what the natural environment does to allow us to thrive, we would all be in a better condition. Oh, I can't, I can't agree more. I'm, I'm here in Northern California between some rivers and some, uh, some mountains myself. And I can, I can liken to that. Awesome. So, I wish we had, I wish we had more and bigger rivers, like the things they call lakes out here, they are not lakes. And many of them are not even they're reservoirs, right? So like it's, it's, yeah, tough. I, I, well, we, we could use more water here for sure. That's true. We trust me. California could use the same, even though I'm surrounded by it. It feels like sometimes other times, at least this last winter, but, uh, Yes. And so, you know, I just have to, to reflect when you talk about that nature part, I, I'm still thinking of the idea of slowing down, of not being so stressed out, of, of focusing and taking the time to, to build relationships or to reflect or, or to just instill some of that kind of self-awareness and social awareness around you that it was so core to our discussion. So Ethan, thank you so much for the, for the discussion. Before we go, um, where can everybody connect with you? Cool. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ethan Butte. Last name is spelled B-E-U-T-E. You can find me on pretty much every social network by first name and last name. You know, Twitter and Instagram, they're jammed together. LinkedIn, other places, they're separated. First name, last name. Uh, and the company is BombBomb, B-O-M-B, B-O-M-B, um, BombBomb.com and BombBomb on all the social networks. Perfect. And make sure to check out his books, Human Centered Communication, and then also Rehumanizing Your Business. Ethan, thank you again so much for having this conversation with me and taking the time. I appreciate it. A joy. I enjoyed it very much too. And you asked a number of questions about things that I obviously care about that I don't get to have a discussion about very often. So it was a pleasure and a joy for me too. Well, we will be having a lot more of these. I can't wait to have you back on again and continue the discussion. Um, To our audience, thank you all for joining and listening. Ethan, thank you again. And uh, for next episode, uh, we will see you soon on the B2B EQ podcast. Until then, have a good one. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.